Thank you. We move now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Does the First Minister accept that what she describes as a positive destination for young people when they leave school may in fact be no such thing? First Minister. Uh, no, we want to see all of our young people go into not just positive destinations, but meaningful destinations. That means further education, further training, uh, or a good and meaningful job. I heard Ruth Davidson talk uh, at the weekend about uh, the concept of lifelong apprenticeships. Uh, I'm not sure if she's aware that we already have lifelong apprenticeships in Scotland. There's no age limit on our modern apprenticeships. And of course, we are increasing uh, the number just as we are increasing the reach of vocational education in our classrooms. So we'll get on with uh, doing the job of improving education, uh, early years, school education, further and higher education, and the routes into work for all of our young people. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but my question quoted directly from IPPR Scotland, a well-respected think tank, which this week welcomed Scottish Conservative proposals to introduce a new skills participation age of 18. It warned that what the SNP government calls positive destinations for young people are often no such thing, and that in reality, we're letting young people down right across Scotland. Whereas Keir Bloomer, the architect of Curriculum for Excellence, said the Lever destination statistics are a fraud. Under this SNP government, the proportion of pupils leaving school with no qualifications whatsoever is at the highest level since 2011. And many others are leaving school at 16 without going on to get the skills and education that they need to thrive in the modern world. Now, I know that this is the First Minister's stated priority, so can she tell me what percentage of 16 to 19 year olds are currently not in education or in any formal training? First Minister. Well, there are 95% of those who leave school are after three months uh, from leaving school are in uh, work, training or study. And I'm sorry to disagree with Ruth Davidson, but I don't consider a young person in further education or in higher education uh, or doing a modern apprenticeship as not been doing something positive Thank and you. meaningful. It's also the case that since 2014 we've reduced youth unemployment in this country by 40%. Uh, percent. We're seeing rising numbers staying on in school. There are more people staying on beyond 16 in school now than has ever been the case uh, before. And of course we're seeing uh, record numbers going into positive destinations. And in terms of uh, school qualifications, I had this exchange a couple of weeks ago with Jackson Carlaw. We actually see now uh, a higher proportion of young people getting qualifications at level 5. 71% in 2007, 86% now. A higher uh, percentage getting qualifications at level 6. 41% in 2007, 62% now, and more young people, of course, leaving school uh, with five or more hires. So the problem with the analysis that Ruth Davidson brings to this chamber is that it's not borne out by the excellent results being achieved by young people the length and breadth of our country. Ruth Davidson. I might have been away for six months, but the format hasn't changed because the First Minister <laughs> is once again answering a different question to the question that she was asked. And the figure is one in five. Fully 20% of our 16 to 19 year olds are without any form of education or formal training. A figure which has been flatlining for years. And I say that is simply wrong. Now we're not the only people that are talking about a skills participation age of 18. Indeed it already works well in Belgium, in Denmark and in the Netherlands. And it had previously been proposed here in Scotland too. But when this SNP government came to power, the idea was quietly dropped, with no explanation ever really given as to why. Does the First Minister believe that that was a mistake? First Minister. Uh, no, I think uh, the policies we are pursuing to make sure more of our young people uh, leave school with qualifications, more of our young people go into work, uh, training or further study, I think these are the right policies to pursue and we'll continue to do so. Uh, just as an aside though, I, I suspect that a lot of the people that Ruth Davidson, young people that Ruth Davidson has just cited there has not uh, been in uh, study or training are actually young people that are in work. Uh, and I go back to the statistics I quoted earlier on. We have reduced youth unemployment in this country by Absolutely. 40 percent in the last five years. Uh, we also uh, see modern apprenticeships 
increasing. There are now foundation apprenticeships uh, available at the vast majority uh, of secondary schools across our country. That is also increasing. Uh, so more of our young people are leaving school with qualifications. Uh, more of our young people are leaving school with vocational qualifications and more of our young people than ever before are going into good, positive, meaningful destinations. And also the attainment gap there is narrowing as well. So we will continue uh, to pursue and implement the policies that are delivering these results for young people all over our country. Ruth Davidson. Half the time she complains folk don't bring ideas to the chamber. Today she's complaining that we do. Because, presiding officer, this is a, a pretty serious proposal, and there is no reason why it can't command cross-party support. Yeah. Now, I believe that we could all agree that we're not doing nearly enough for young people who don't go to university, and that politicians of all stripes need to up our game in our delivery for them. For all the time debating the powers of this place, and we've seen the government put another one on hold this week, education and training is an area where this chamber is able to act, it's able to act immediately, it's able to act without question. So I asked the First Minister, does she accept the need for change now? And when it comes to a skills participation age of 18, will she today give a commitment to act now? First Minister. The commitment that we will continue, we will continue to act as we are doing. We will continue to take forward the policies in our schools, the policies on modern apprenticeships, uh, the policies on foundation apprenticeships, uh, the places at further education, the investments in free higher education, which will always remain with the SNP. And as I said earlier to Ruth Davidson and said to her deputy a couple of weeks ago, the problem with her analysis, of course, is that it is not borne out by the results that our young people are getting in our education system and as they go on into work. We will consider ideas from wherever they come. I would simply say to uh, Ruth Davidson, if uh, this idea is such a, a great one, why didn't she bother mentioning it in this leaflet she sent out to every uh, voter across the country? where she manages to mention independence 15 times. She manages to mention me 12 times. Thank you very much for the free publicity. But not a single idea, not a single policy, because actually the Tories don't have any. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Um. Presiding officer, this week marks 20 years of this Scottish Parliament. 20 years when this Parliament has had full control over housing policy. And during that time, the private rented sector in Scotland has trebled in size. We have seen the return of private landlordism and rents have soared whilst wages have stagnated. The government's response is rent pressure zones but Edinburgh City Council concluded that rent pressure zones are not fit for purpose. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Well, the private rented sector has increased. I know that uh, from the experience of my own constituency, many members uh, will know the same. Uh, but that's why we have introduced legislation uh, to reform the private rented sector. For example, the policy that has just been announced for consultation uh, south of the border, uh, getting rid of no-fault evictions, is something that this government has already done and implemented. Rent pressure zones uh, was uh, the way forward. We will continue to look at whether that is appropriate and satisfactory and where further action is required. We will consider taking that further action. But what we are also doing, uh, which I, I have to point out, the last Labour administration uh, in the early days of this Scottish Parliament didn't do, is invest in affordable social housing for rent as well. We are putting record sums into that. Uh, and we're delivering record numbers of affordable and social housing. Uh, and, you know, we've also made reforms at getting rid of the right to buy as well. So this government's record on housing is a good one, and we will continue to make sure that we deliver the policies that people across the country need. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, I think the First Minister's calculator needs adjusting because Labour built 35,000 social houses when we were in power. Over the past 15 years, over the past 15 years, a private rented home has become the only housing option for an increasing number of families right across Scotland. And housing costs are eating into people's incomes. And year on year, 
rents are going up. The average rent for a two-bedroom home in Greater Glasgow has increased by over 30% in the last decade. In Lothian, the increase is by over 40%. And these increases are driving more and more families into poverty. Can the First Minister tell us how many children in Scotland in the private rented sector are now living in poverty? First Minister. Children in Scotland, whether they're in the private rented sector uh, or the social rented sector or in any sector, are living in poverty. And largely the increases in poverty are down to the welfare cuts being imposed by a Tory government that Richard Leonard still wants them to have the ability to do. In terms of uh, the private rented uh, sector, we have uh, taken action already. The Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016, uh, which was the most significant change in private renting in Scotland for 30 years, gives tenants greater security, greater stability and greater predictability. Uh, the new private residential tenancy, landlords can evict a tenant simply because uh, the tenancy reaches an end. And of course, that act also provides a range of measures to help tackle high rents, limiting rent increases to once in 12 months, enabling tenants to challenge unfair rent increases and also providing local authorities uh, with the power to designate an area as a rent pressure zone. And perhaps it's because of all of that uh, that the latest data from the Office of National Statistics shows that increases in rent in Scotland across all private tenancies are lower than in England or in Labour-run Wales. Uh, so we're taking the action that needs to be taken and we will continue to do so. But unlike Richard Leonard, we will also continue to oppose not just the Tory welfare policies that are driving uh, people into poverty, uh, but we will continue to oppose having those powers in the hands of the Tories in the first place. Richard Leonard. Well, if you use the powers that you've got, you might have a better case to make for having more of them. Presiding officer, the First Minister talks about the latest data. The latest data, according to the Scottish Government's own figures, is that over 40% of all children living in the private rented sector in Scotland are now living in poverty. That's 60,000 children. And here in Edinburgh, there is a particularly acute problem, which is why Dr Jim McCormack of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation recently concluded, and I quote, here and now, the single biggest challenge for Edinburgh is housing costs. The pathway to poverty reduction in Edinburgh has a lot to do with getting control of rents in the private rented sector. Next week, Labour will take the next step in the parliamentary process with our Mary Barber law. We think that private sector rent rises should be capped and controlled. So the First Minister has a choice. Will she take the side of rogue landlords and a broken housing market? Or will she join with us, side with tenants, tackle poverty and back our Mary Barber bill? First Minister. Well, we'll continue to do what we have done over these past few years, and that is lead from the front in the changes that people in the private rented sector uh, need, and we will continue uh, to do that. Uh, poverty rates, child poverty rates are too high uh, in Scotland, not just in the private rented sector, but across our society. In Scotland, the child poverty rate is 22%. That is far too high, but I should say it is lower than the 26% in Wales where Labour right now are in government, which shows that Labour talk about all the things they would do in government, but when they're in government, they somehow forget to do any of them. So we will continue to take the action that keeps rent increases lower than in other parts of the UK, that gets child poverty down, um, and we'll consider all proposals that come forward on their merit, but we won't wait for Labour, because if we waited for Labour over these past uh, number of years, we wouldn't have the changes we already have, and we wouldn't have the record numbers of affordable and social housing that are now being delivered across Scotland, which stands in sharp contrast to the six council houses built under the last Labour government. There's a number of uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from John Scott to be followed by Christine Graham. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of allegations of staff bullying at NHS Ayrshire and Arden hospitals, and I share these concerns raised by staff in the press. My concern is for patient safety and also the safety of staff in a mental health context 
not just in the radiology department, but across all staff in the hospitals, where regrettably my constituents have in the past made similar allegations of bullying as well. Today, the Stud report will be published into allegations of bullying in NHS Highland. Will the First Minister now consider an, a similar investigation into these concerns raised by staff in Ayrshire? First Minister. Well, first, can I say that we take uh, all allegations of bullying in the NHS extremely seriously, as uh, you would expect us to do. Indeed, the Health Secretary will this afternoon make a statement to Parliament on the Sturrock Review, which I think is a sign of how seriously we do take uh, these issues when uh, they are raised with us. In terms of the NHS Ayrshire and Allen, Arden situation, uh, the Health Board has advised that they are in contact with the Society of Radiographers and the Chief Executive offered to meet uh, with the staff concerned. I understand that offer was declined, so arrangements are now in place to hear the grievance in accordance with the board policy. I think it is important now that that internal grievance process is given the chance to conclude in line with employment law uh, before there is any consideration of further action. Uh, but I will give an assurance that these issues are always taken extremely seriously by the government. Christine Graham to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, changes to parking policy at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh has meant several of my constituents working there now have their staff parking permits under review. And if these are revoked because of shift work and travelling from rural areas, the option of public transport simply doesn't exist. Some may even have to give up their jobs there, apart from the current stress they're undergoing. Notwithstanding this is a private finance hospital and the contract for parking is private, is there a role for the Scottish Government as these changes must surely affect the delivery of health care in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh? Well, in terms of the uh, change to policy that Christine Graham uh, raises, I would thank her for raising this. I'll ask the Health Secretary to look into that uh, and see whether there is any uh, action that requires uh, to be taken. We want uh, staff working in our NHS to be able to park if they are required to do so at our hospitals. In terms of uh, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, of course, if that wasn't a PFI uh, contract entered into under a previous administration, we'd be able to abolish uh, car parking charges there, as we've done so already at NHS car parks across uh, the country. Uh, but I will undertake uh, to ask Jean Freeman to look into the specific issue Christine Graham uh, raises and get back to her as soon as possible. Tavish Scott to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The central nursery in Shetland will close in a month's time. Uh, the, the nursery have failed to recruit staff because the public sector are paying more and recruiting uh, to fulfil the expansion of uh, childcare. 20 families will be directly affected uh, by the loss of the nursery uh, run by Mary Jimison and her team. What can the First Minister do to ensure that wraparound care uh, is provided, uh, for, particularly for mums who want to stay in work uh, at a time when this expansion is, is happening, so that these private sector nurses can stay, nurseries can stay open rather than being forced to close? First Minister. Uh, I'm happy to ask Marie Todd, uh, the childcare minister, to uh, liaise with uh, the member and indeed with Shetland Council about the particular issue raised about the nursery. Uh, generally speaking, uh, of course, the expansion of early years and childcare is extremely important and in terms of uh, recruitment and funding, part of the funding deal uh, we have uh, reached with local authorities uh, includes money to allow fair funding rates for uh, private sector local authorities so that fair wages can be paid there as well and of course we uh, insist on the living wage uh, being paid. Uh, it's important that as well as the expansion we do work with local authorities and local authorities work with private and third sector providers to ensure that wraparound care that is important for parents but I will ask uh, Marie to look into the specific issues uh, and to see uh, and then after that to come back to Tavish Scott in more detail. And Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, on Monday night next week Dundee City Council will consider a very worrying report on attainment in our schools. At S3 Dundee's results are down across every literacy and numeracy indicator and the attainment gap is closing, not because results are markedly better in our poorest communities, but because attainment has declined rapidly among our most affluent pupils. Does the First Minister think that the problem could be the three million pounds the SNP have taken out of Dundee education budget this year alone, the 160 teachers they have taken out of our secondary schools since they came to power in the city, their blanket policy across the city of limiting Dundee pupils to six qualifications in S4, teaching S4, 5 and 6 in the same classroom in some schools, and the disappearance of some core subjects in some schools. Or what does the First Minister think the problem is, or the reasons are, and what is she going to do about it? First Minister. 
Well, it is right that Dundee City Council looks closely at uh, its attainment figures and if there is action it requires to take, that it takes that action. In terms of the Scottish Government, we are providing additional funding to local authorities generally, but also additional funding uh, specifically for attainment through uh, the Pupil Equity Fund, which schools and teachers the length and breadth of the country uh, are using to good effect to close the attainment uh, gap. And we will continue to work with and support councils to make sure that the right action is taken, not just to raise attainment, uh, but to close the attainment gap uh, as well. And that applies to Dundee City Council, as it does to every council across the country. Thank you. And question number three from Willie Rennie. This week, the Scottish Government abandoned its plan to abolish air passenger duty. It said it was not consistent with its climate change ambitions. Is the First Minister seriously telling us she has only recently discovered that hundreds of extra flights are bad for climate change? So will the Government now ditch its support for the third runway at Heathrow? First Minister. Well, I'm sure Willie Rennie didn't uh, forget to notice last week that we had a new report from the C Committee on Climate Change that recommended increased targets uh, on tackling emissions and reducing emissions. We, unlike any other government so far in the UK, have accepted those recommendations. So that means we have to uh, look across the range of our policies to make sure that they do align with that increased scale of ambition. Uh, the air departure tax is one of those policies. There's a case that can be made for that. I have made that case uh, often in the past, but it doesn't any longer align with the ambition we have to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. And as I said, um, in this chamber last week and as I said very very openly we will require to look at all of our policies across all areas of Scottish government responsibility through that new lens of climate change so whether it's the policy uh, that Willie Rennie cites today or any other policy that's the commitment that we are making but I put back the same challenge that I did last week to all of the opposition parties with the exception of the Greens in uh, this chamber when we come to discuss workplace parking over the next few weeks are the opposition parties going to look at that through the lens of climate change or are they going to stick to their knee-jerk anti-climate uh, opposition? Willie Rennie. I think everyone will have noticed that the First Minister deliberately dodged my question. The question was about Heathrow and the third runway. The time for dithering, First Minister, is over. A third runway with hundreds of extra flights will not help climate change. I can't understand why the Scottish Government chose the 20th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament to hand a raft of powers back to Westminster. When John Swinney handed back income tax powers, we thought it was a one-off. But this week, it was powers away on value-added tax. And of course, social security powers have been sent back for five years. We've had the shambles of the police merger. The law on waiting times broken. Schools slipping down the international rankings and the failing railways. After 12 years in power, isn't it true that she is handing back powers to Westminster because her government is so incompetent it just cannot cope? First Minister. You know, if all of that is true, imagine how frustrating it must be for Willie Rennie to know that we're still, what, around 30 points ahead of his party in the opinion poll. For goodness sake, the fact of the matter is, whether it's polls, whether it's real elections, people in Scotland know the achievements of this SNP Scottish Government, which is why they want us to continue in office. And on powers for this parliament, take welfare. It's because our, uh, of our use of new powers that every carer across Scotland right now is getting an extra £450 a year. It's because of our use of new powers that low-income families are getting more help when they have a child or when that child goes to nursery or again when that child starts school. And on the issue of VAT, I mean, really? Uh, what power exactly is being devolved to this parliament over VAT? No power to set the rates or levels yep. of VAT, just an assignment of revenues based on dodgy estimates. And I have to ask Willie Rennie, when you've got the Fraser of Allender Institute saying that this exposes the Scottish budget to unnecessary and unreasonable risk and is not a good way forward, why on earth 
does the Scottish Liberal Democrats want to do that to the Scottish budget? If they keep taking positions like that, they'll keep languishing in the opinion polls. We're going to take a few supplementaries. The first from Neil Findlay to be followed by Jamie Green. Neil Findlay. This week I have been contacted by constituents who are victims of MESH but do not want to be named. They have raised with me the issue of women being directed to so-called centre centres of excellence in Edinburgh and Glasgow for treatment, uh, where, they may, uh, where many have received partial MESH removal, producing very poor and debilitating results. The belief is that clinicians at these centres do not have the required skill set to carry out full MESH removal using the latest techniques. Uh, one woman who is not my constituent, who has broken her anonymity, is Claire Daisley, who will lose her bowel and bladder if she doesn't get a full mesh removal within the next two months. Uh, will the First Minister personally intervene in Claire's case to ensure that she gets the treatment she deserves? And will she halt partial mesh removal at these centres until a full appraisal is carried out? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I... Can I thank uh, Neil Finlay for raising what we all uh, agree is an important issue. I will obviously not clinically intervene in any individual's case, but I will undertake uh, to have the Health Secretary look into the, the case that has been brought to Parliament uh, today and to, to make sure that all uh, possible has been done uh, for that uh, individual concerned. Um, more generally, as Neil Finlay knows, uh, the Health Secretary met uh, with a group of women. I think that was facilitated or certainly attended by Neil Finlay. As a result of that, a group of medical directors and senior clinical managers are looking at uh, a range of options to improve care and support. Um, the groups considering the course of care for women who suffer complications um, and examining a whole range of issues. It met for the first time in early April and I can uh, tell the Chamber today it will meet uh, for a second time uh, tomorrow and that group will make recommendations to Health Board Chief Executives and aims to do so by the autumn of this year and uh, that group will fully take into account the views that patients are expressing. Uh, the last thing I would say to uh, Neil Finlay, I absolutely understand why some women will want to uh, retain anonymity and privacy uh, but if there are any uh, individual women that Neil Finlay is aware of uh, who want confidentially to speak uh, to the health secretary or to health officials uh, then we would be very happy and very keen indeed to facilitate that on the assurance of protecting the privacy and anim anonymity of them. Jamie Green to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Jamie Thank Green. you. Uh, visitors from China spend £36 million pounds per year in Scotland. And last year, First Minister, you said tourism is a vital part of Scotland's economy and these figures demonstrate the growing significance of Chinese visitors. But yesterday we learned that Scotland's only direct route to the country has stopped taking bookings from this September and the future of the route is now in doubt. Does the First Minister share my concern that the potential loss of this route will be a huge loss to the Scottish economy, to Scottish tourism, and that the government should do everything in its power to retain such roots. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government works very hard with our airports to uh, protect uh, air routes. Uh, in terms of the Hainan uh, service, we are disappointed uh, that it has uh, suspended its winter schedule. We hope the service will return for uh, the summer season when passenger numbers are likely to be higher and we will work with the airport and the airline to secure that. Um, Hainan obviously operate other services and we hope that they will continue to do the, the Dublin and Edinburgh uh, service as well. In terms of tourism, uh, our tourism sector uh, has been a, a real area of success in recent years. Uh, we know they uh, face a number of challenges and we work very closely and will continue to work very closely with our tourism sector to uh, support the continued sustainable growth of what is a Scottish economic success story. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Morris Corey. Bruce Thank Crawford. you, President Officer. Last week, Michael Gove told the Tory conference that he wanted the UK government to get involved in devolved areas like health and education in Scotland. He said he wanted to change the rules to do that. Does the First Minister agree with me that after 20 years of devolution, the Tory government at Westminster should keep their grubby hands off this people of Scotland's parliament? First Minister. Yes, I do. When they do devolve powers, they shouldn't send us faulty goods as they have tried to do on VAT and ADT. Um, and they should stop the creeping centralisation that we are seeing as a result of their Brexit chaos. 
Uh, this Parliament is better placed than a Tory government or any UK government to decide what's right for the people of Scotland. And the sooner we see more powers in this Parliament, in fact, the sooner we see this Parliament as an independent Parliament, the better for everyone. Maurice Corrie. <laughs> Presiding officer, for 50 years, generations of submariners based Her Majesty's naval base Clyde and Fez Lane and my region, supported by their families, have borne the huge responsibility of protecting the UK. They have accepted the sacrifice and commitment inherent in this duty. Their professionalism has never wavered and they have delivered on their key task, often for many time, months at a time. Would the First Minister join me in recognising the professionalism? the innovation, dedication and skills of thousands of people at Faslane and Coolport who have supported and crewed our, cruised our, crewed our submarines for more than 350 patrols without one minute's break for 50 years and thank them, their families and veterans most sincerely for their dedication and support to the Royal Navy's submarine service and to our country's security. First Minister. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, I would. Um, I take a very different view to the member on the future of uh, nuclear weapons and the nuclear deterrent. I want to see Scotland and indeed the world uh, be free of nuclear weapons. But that is no reflection uh, whatsoever on the professionalism and the dedication of our service personnel. I would want to see Faz Lane in a nuclear-free Scotland continue as a naval base. So I uh, take this opportunity today to pay tribute to the uh, dedication, the commitment and the professionalism, not just of uh, submariners uh, working in our services, but all service uh, personnel who work so hard uh, to keep all of us safe. Thank you. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government considers the drug policy should be devolved or amended. First Minister. Uh, yes, we believe there is a compelling case that the Misuse of Drugs Act uh, 1971 needs to be substantially amended so that action can be taken to help halt the emergency of drugs deaths. If the UK Government uh, continues to refuse to allow Scotland to take innovative approaches to tackling drug deaths, such as establishing medically supervised drug consumption facilities, we call on them to devolve the powers uh, to this Parliament so that we can do what is necessary. Uh, this week, the Scottish Affairs Committee began their inquiry into problem drug use to examine the issue. Uh, the evidence submitted to the committee so far overwhelmingly supports the need for Scotland to be given additional powers in this area. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, and uh, I'd like to thank the First Minister for that reply and also like to refer members to my register of interests. Uh, despite the emergency, the UK Government still refuses to act and in November every party in this Parliament, except the Tories, voted to call on the UK Government to change the law to allow safe consumption facilities or empower the Scottish Parliament to do so. Does the First Minister agree that further UK Government delay means further harm, further deaths for some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I think there is a recognition across this Parliament, and I think that is without exception, that we need to look at different ways of tackling uh, the drugs challenge and in particular reducing the number of people who lose their lives to drugs. Uh, but as uh, Jackson Callow and I spoke about a few weeks ago, that does mean a willingness to look at different approaches and to be innovative. Uh, the Tories have called on the government to do that. We are willing to do that. But I would today again call on the Tories to drop the knee-jerk opposition to safe uh, consumption facilities. Um, Dr Andrew McCauley, who's a senior research fellow at Glasgow Caledonian University, uh, has said uh, just recently uh, that Glasgow's case for a drug consumption room is arguably the most compelling Europe uh, has seen. Uh, so if it is the case that the UK government will not uh, act to do that, then it should devolve the powers to allow this parliament to do that as part of an overall approach to making sure we take the innovative action uh, to deal with what is a massive challenge for all of us. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I agree with the First Minister. There is a cross-party consensus that we need to see change on this. There's two things the First Minister could do. Firstly, an independent review of the methadone programme in Scotland. And secondly, a third sector-led review of recovery services. Will she commit to that today? Yeah. First well, Minister. We, we are already uh, convening an expert group to examine exactly what changes, either in practice or in the law, could help save lives and reduce harm. So we are doing the kind of things that Miles Briggs is calling for us to do and our mind 
Our mind is not closed to any uh, suggestion that comes forward about how we can do this differently. Uh, my ask of others, though, is not to close their minds. When we have health professionals uh, and experts in this field saying that this is one of the most important things we could do uh, in Glasgow right now, then it is unconscionable that we have a UK government, despite admitting that they know the benefits it might bring, standing in the way of that. So if we're going to have an open-minded approach to this, which I'm certainly signed up to, that has to apply right across the board. And sadly, the Tories so far have been found completely lacking and wanting in this. Alexander, sorry, question number five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in light of recent analysis, which suggests that a record number of Scottish shops closed in the first three months of the year. First Minister. Well, we're doing everything within our power to support all sectors of our economy, including retail. We have enhanced measures to support both new development and reuse of vacant property in town centres uh, as part of a total rates relief package of around £750 million. That includes the small business bonus scheme, which, of course, uh, lifts over 100,000 properties out of business rates altogether. Uh, in addition to that, we've established a £50 million uh, capital town centre fund to enable local authorities to stimulate and support a wide range of investments which encouraged town centres to diversify. And in 2017-18, there were over 1,600 new starts in the retail modern apprenticeship framework. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. Is it not the case that the single most detrimental effect on our high streets are the crippling business rates, and in particular, the large business supplement, which this government is imposing on hardworking retailers? Some business owners in my own region have had to endure eye-watering increases which are making both the cost and stress of operating premises unsustainable. So what further action will the First Minister take to turn this tide? First Minister. Well, we'll continue to support uh, retail and we'll continue to support our 10 centres, but th that question is absolutely staggering in just how much it ignores about what is being done already in Scotland. We have the most competitive business rates package anywhere in the UK. That involves the lowest business rates poundage in the UK, uh, which ensures that over 90% over 90% of properties are charged a lower rate than they would be in England. Uh, we've got the most generous package of reliefs, which, as I said a moment ago, is worth over uh, £750 million. That includes the small business bonus, uh, the unique in the UK business growth accelerator, the UK's first nursery relief, uh, and, of course, enhanced relief for uh, broadband. Uh, we've also expanded the small business uh, bonus uh, scheme, lifting in total 100,000 premises out of business rates altogether. Uh, and of course, following the Community Empowerment Act, councils now have the powers to go even further if they want to reduce uh, rates further than that uh, locally. So we are doing more than any other government anywhere else in the UK, and we will continue to do so. We wouldn't be able to afford to do most of this, though, if we went along with the Tory suggestions to take more than half a billion pounds out of our budget Absolutely. to give tax cuts to the richest people in our country. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Reports call for a transformation, transformative change. First Minister. I welcome this important report and the new evidence that it provides. We are, of course, already doing a great deal here in Scotland to address biodiversity loss through our biodiversity strategy. Uh, we will consider the report's findings very carefully and look to ensure that our actions will produce the transformative change that is needed. Uh, the report is a significant step on the way to the 2020 conference of parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity to be held in China, where world governments will agree their response to the new evidence. Uh, Scotland is playing an active role in this work and I can uh, tell the Chamber that we've agreed with the Convention that a conference which will contribute to developing the response will be held in Scotland early in 2020 in the lead-up to the China Conference of the Parties. Claudia Beamish. I thank the First Minister for this answer, but this report is indeed a stark look at how we are letting down our natural world globally. And Scotland faces the same challenges. One in 11 species in Scotland are at risk of extinction, and we need stronger laws and implementation. Biodiversity in our climate and environment emergency deserves the same collective focus and energy as our climate change does. 
Does the First Minister agree that it now seems extremely unlikely that we will meet our 2020 global biodiversity targets? And will the First Minister commit today to developing a long-term plan for action post-2020? First Minister. Uh, I agree with Claudia Beamish um, in the general uh, thrust of her question. In terms of the biodiversity targets, first, Scotland has more to do, like all countries have more to do. Uh, we are currently on track to achieve seven out of the 20 targets uh, agreed by the international community in 2010. Another 12 are progressing towards the target, but we need to step up uh, our work to meet the deadline. Now, that's not good enough, but it compares favourably to the global picture, uh, where progress has only been made on four of the, the 20 targets. So we recognise uh, the additional work that all countries, including Scotland, has to do. Uh, we're committed, and if we do this, we'll be the first country anywhere to do this, to carry out a thorough analysis of what we are already doing, uh, what more we need to do, and what we need to do differently. And by the end of this year, uh, ministers will write to the Environment Committee with their initial assessment of that. Uh, so I do agree about the importance of this. I do agree that it's as important as uh, the challenge on climate change. And as on climate change, uh, I don't underestimate the difficulties and the complexities and the challenges. But as on climate change, I, and I'm sure all of us, want Scotland to be leading the way. Mark Ruskell. The UN report highlights once again that our seas are under attack and beautiful habitats like our flame shell reefs risk extinction. One fifth of Europe's coastline is in Scotland. Does the First Minister believe that just two fisheries protection vessels are enough to defend our coasts from vested interests intent on illegally plundering our marine protected areas? First Minister. Uh, well, I mean, that's something we as a government require to keep under review. I, I do believe uh, the resources we have just now in terms of fisheries protection are uh, appropriate. But like all uh, issues like this, this is something that the government has to look at on an ongoing basis. The protection of our natural environment is uh, such a priority that across, just as on climate change, uh, the obligation on all of us now is to look afresh at everything we are doing uh, and make a decision as we had to do on a difficult decision this week and decide whether we are living up to those obligations. And as a government, we are committed to doing that. And I hope we have uh, not just the cooperation, but the wholehearted support of parties across the chamber as we do so. And Maurice Golden. <clears throat> on the 14th of September, 2016, I raised the need for a biodiversity baseline with the Environment Secretary in order to monitor the success of our efforts to protect Scotland's wildlife. Given the First Minister's answers, will she now uh, recognise that a biodiversity baseline should be a priority? First Minister. If we go back, I think, one or two answers ago, what I said is we are uh, carrying out an analysis of what we are doing, uh, where we need to do more and what we need to do differently. That is what we will report to the Environment Committee uh, by the end of this year, providing, I think, the baseline uh, that Maurice Golden is asking for. He's absolutely right. We need to know the baseline so that we can then monitor our performance uh, against this. Um, there are big challenges here for Scotland and for all countries. I think we can take some uh, pride and some confidence in the fact that we are already leading the way globally, but that's not enough. We need to, as we've done on climate change, raise the bar of global leadership and make sure that we are continuing uh, to get over that uh, much higher than anybody else. And we're committed to doing that. And I look forward to having the support of uh, members across the chamber as we do so. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Kenneth Gibson on changes to pension credit could cost mixed age couples £7,320 annually. Uh, before we do, we're going to have a short suspension to allow the gallery members and the minister to change sheets. A a short suspension.